all these days making us very happy indeed, and yet as we conclude these days, they are not yet over. We have the pleasure and the privilege of hearing once again from our president, Brother Noor, who is to give the closing remarks. Brother Noor, please. Jehovah God certainly has been good to all of us in allowing us to come to this triumphant kingdom assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses. He has given us so much to think about, so many things to direct our minds along the right way of thinking. And this is so essentially important for every one of us who have dedicated our lives to the service of the sovereign ruler of the universe. There is no question about it, but we are a separate people. And we have to keep separated from this old world, otherwise we'll find ourselves in great difficulty and maybe eventually going back to that old world and dying with it in the Battle of Armageddon. That certainly is one thing that none of us want to do or have happened to us. That's why it is so necessary for us to keep our minds stayed upon Jehovah God and the great work that he is having the New World Society do at the present time. Satan the devil is a very wily foe and he's anxious to devour us just like a lion would devour its adversary. He'd like to have us turn away from being faithful in this wonderful work that we have undertaken. He tries many tactics in order to unbalance us and to turn us aside. Sometimes, having been in the truth for a number of years, and even those uh, coming into the truth now may find just a few years tiresome, but if you have the truth, if you love Jehovah God and His Son Christ Jesus and the new world of righteousness, you'll never find the truth tiresome. you love to do it day in and day out. But the devil would like to make you feel as though it's too much for you. And when you once begin to feel that way, he begins to break you down. There appear to be two ways in which the devil is trying to attack Jehovah's Witnesses at the present time. They're outstanding. One is very easily to see. The other is sometimes most subtle. When the devil, through his organization, visible and invisible, attacks us through persecution, through trials, difficulties, putting us in prison because we preach the good news of the kingdom, as they do behind the Iron Curtain in totalitarian lands, and often where persecution becomes great in democratic countries, then we can see the hand of the devil. It's obvious. Often it's very easy for us to stand up against the devil's organization when we are persecuted, because we see our adversary, and we can see the way he works and what he's trying to slow down. On the other hand, we are so determined that by Jehovah's undeserved kindness we'll battle through. Now there's another method that he can work on us to try to slow us down, and that is through materialism. Quite often in the affairs of life, we find that the comforts of this world will attract us. And while we may have a good home, a nice car, the things we need in the way of food, shelter, and clothing, we may step out and strive for a bigger and better home, more food, more clothing than what we need. And before we know it, we're so entangled in working for this 
standard of competition in the old world, seeking the things that are material, that we work so hard to get them that we begin to cut in on our service activity, seeking first the kingdom interest. Now there's no question about it, but what Jehovah God is guiding and directing his people and bringing the proper admonition and advice to us through his organization constantly. The Watchtower keeps us informed as to these subtle schemes of the devil, but sometimes we read them in cold print and we think that, well, I hope that other person I know sees that and reads this article. But let's not worry so much about the other person. Let us uh, begin looking at ourselves. We're the only one that uh, can take care of ourselves as far as maintaining our integrity is concerned. We can't maintain it for someone else. We can only maintain it for ourselves. So then let us look at ourselves and see where we stand in this old world and how the devil may be attacking us. I want to tell you a little story of uh, some of our brothers over in Hungary. The devil's organization over there, of course, wants to break down Jehovah's Witnesses' organization, the New World Society, and the way they do it is through persecution. When the communists took over those countries of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Eastern Germany, they brought pressure upon Jehovah's Witnesses because we preach the kingdom of God and we stand for it absolutely. But they would like to see us stop preaching that and talking in favor of communism like all other organizations are forced to do. But we refuse. We stand our ground and when persecution becomes too great and they break up our halls, take away our property, we move underground and by Jehovah's undeserved kindness and direction do even greater work. Today in those countries behind the Iron Curtain, there are between 65 and 70,000 witnesses of Jehovah as compared with a few years ago of only 40,000. So the work grows. But it isn't growing because of any blessing of communism. It's growing only because Jehovah God loves his people and is pouring his blessing out upon them. Can you imagine a country where the branch servant, the district servant, the circuit servants are all taken in by the communistic organizations, thrown into prison and into jail, off into work camps and finally into mines, there to slave for the communistic government? You'd think, well, what would happen to the congregations? What would happen to Jehovah's people? And the communists feel when they do such things to Jehovah's people that the whole organization will automatically break down. They think when they can get a hold of a branch servant, the circuit servants, the district servants, it'll fold up. They have sent some of their spies, their secret service men, around the people that they knew to be Jehovah's Witnesses and feigned interest in our work. And so the sister began to study with two secret servicemen of communism. However, she didn't know that they were communist spies trying to get into our organization underground. And for months she studied with them. She was very careful. They even wanted to go out in the field service, and they did. And of course, after they showed interest in taking chances and preaching the good news as she did, well, she took them to the little group of eight or nine that met together to study God's Word. They knew that wasn't the little group that was doing the great work of witnessing. They wanted to get into the next uh, group. So they found the study conductor, kind to him. More months went by. Finally, they learned who the congregation servant was of the entire city. A little more time. And a circuit servant was calling around. But having learned the structure of the organization by then, they knew that there were other circuit servants and district servants. So they stayed with the organization for well over a year, 
trying to find the other circuit servants, and eventually they learned who the district servant was. Of course, they had to be zealous. They had to be real hypocrites, which they were. And then after they had found out what they thought was the one who was running the organization and guiding all of Jehovah's people in Hungary, then they sprung their trap. Took in the district servant, many of the circuit servants, some of the leading congregational servants, and they disappeared. But what happened? The work kept on going. These communists are foolish enough, even after studying with Jehovah's Witnesses for months and years, to still believe it's run by man. They don't know that Jehovah God is running it through his son Christ Jesus. So it is in all parts of the world, no matter how great the pressure may be. Jehovah's Witnesses will continue to serve their God, even though they kill them. In Hungary, we have a number of our leading brothers who have been branch servants, district servants in this mine. There they really work, literally underground. They take them down into the hole in the morning. Down there underground, they preach to the other men that they work alongside of and dig. But the man who is at the head of this uh, work camp of the communist organization has been a little favorable to the extent of saying, well, now all of you Jehovah's Witnesses must meet in the same barracks and sleep there. But you cannot go to other barracks and preach your doctrine. As long as you behave yourselves, do your work, stay in this camp, I don't care if you study your Bible or not, you can't do any harm in this camp. So he's allowed them to have their theocratic school, their studies, and sometimes these brothers get the watchtower in these camps. Of course, we don't tell the communists how it gets in, but they get it, they read it, and they discourse in, in their barracks on it. Well, the brothers agreed that they would not step outside of their barracks night, but they would rejoice and study together. But one brother got the idea, well now, I'm just going to go over to another barracks. They were all told you shouldn't do it. If you're going to do any preaching, let's do it down in the mine alongside of the men we work. But this one individual said, well, I'm going out to another barracks, and I'm going to start a Bible study. So he was up separate. When contrary to our own suggestions in that camp, the brothers in charge, and he went to the other barracks, started his study, he was caught. The most severe punishment that this communist man in charge of the camp felt that he could give this brother was to forbid him to speak at the theocratic school for eight months period of time. When he was told that that was his punishment, he wept. Taking away a privilege of service which to him he cherished, he loved, to be able to go to the theocratic school and every so often get up and give an eight minute talk on the Bible for the comfort and the encouragement of his other brothers and then this was taken away as a punishment. I wonder how many here would feel it was a punishment because of some wrongdoing you did in the congregation your school servant would say to you, for the next eight months, you're going to be struck off the rolls of theocratic school. Would you feel sad? Or would you say, as some might say, boy, that's a break. How do you feel about your dedication to Jehovah God? How devoted are you to Jehovah's service? How much love do you have for gaining spiritual mindedness? This matter of being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is a very serious thing. We're not joining another religion. We have come to a position within Jehovah's organization where he calls us his other sheep, his anointed, he calls this a new world society. 
It's made up only by persons who have dedicated themselves to Jehovah's service. Now, how far does your dedication reach out? Do you love the truth so much that you're going to attend all the meetings? That you're going to take your share in theocratic school, service meetings, comment at the watchtower studies? And you mothers and fathers, are you going to study in your home with your children and see to it that they learn the truth from God's word? Are you going to take that responsibility or are you just going to let your children run and do as they please and say, well, when they get old enough, we'll let them figure it out for themselves. Brothers and sisters, we are in a new world society. We see Jehovah's organization. We see Jehovah has come to his temple. And we see a great crowd of people going up to that court of the temple there to worship day and night. And the people that are going up to that temple to worship are listening to the law of Jehovah, are seeking to walk in his paths and to learn of his ways. How seriously do you take it? Looking again at this other trial which uh, comes to us concerning materialism, I remember a missionary that has gone through Gilead School, served many years in the pioneer service, was sent off to a foreign assignment, worked well for a few years, was appointed as a congregational servant, but then while he was away in this very fine place to witness and serve God, he saw an opportunity to make money. He had a missionary home to live in, all the shelter he needed. He had food to eat because the society supplied all that he needed. He had clothing to wear because he placed sufficient literature and other income that he could get what he needed. He had shelter, he had food, he had clothing. And he had the most glorious treasure a witness for Jehovah God in a foreign land. But over there was a little farm. He could buy it cheap. He could raise coffee. He could make a lot of money. He could live comfortably the rest of his life. He could take his missionary wife out of the service. So he decided, that's what I'll do. I'll store up for myself treasures, earthly treasures. He quit the missionary home. He quit the pioneer work. He got his little farm. He went out and started to raise coffee, started to make money. He was still the congregational servant. He never came to meetings, didn't arrange for the service meetings, didn't come to the watchtower studies. And the brothers that he was there to feed and look after, he completely neglected. Why? For the material things of this world. It was hard for these brothers in this land to understand why a man who claims to be wholly dedicated to Jehovah God and still claims it, and still believes he's in the New World Society, and still thinks he's going through the Battle of Armageddon and living in the New World, can turn around so far to neglect even the congregation which he was supposed to feed. Materialism. It's dangerous. Sometimes we think that it's so important that we have all the things of this world and we have to have television, not only one, but a couple. And then because some big radio station or some great firm in this country puts on an extraordinarily good program on a meeting night, you may even think it's necessary to stay home from the study of God's Word to see that bit of entertainment. If an automobile, if a television, if a radio set or an icebox or anything else is going to keep you out of God's service, you better get rid of it.
If these things are going to help you put in more time and help you preach this good news of the kingdom, all well and good. But be careful that the things that are so attractive and so nice and so pleasant to use and to have do not accomplish the devil's purpose. There's nothing wrong with the use of these things. They're perfectly all right. But when they make you their slave, then they're all wrong. Jesus says it's better to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand if they're going to keep you out of the kingdom. And we better look at the things that are material in the same way when they begin to pull us away from the grand, glorious treasure of service which we have then we better watch ourselves. Is it true, brothers, that you can only put in two or three hours in the field service in a month? Is it true that out of all of 30 days with its 24 hours every day, that you can only witness in the interest of the kingdom just a couple of hours? How many people do you meet in a day who do you work with? Who do you eat with at noon lunch hour? What do you do in your evenings? How do you go to your book studies? What do you do with your Saturday afternoons, your Sundays? You mean to say that all your time is so taken up that some of you can't put in more than two or three hours and some none at all, becoming ir irregular publishers, not going out in the field service, not one hour during a whole month. Now when we come to a convention like the Triumphant Kingdom Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses and hear all of these fine talks given by our brothers, it should cause us to think, it should worry us a little bit. But your worrying about it isn't going to get anything done because worry never gets anything done. The only thing that gets something done in this world is work. So work about it. Don't worry. A lot of you folks have children. They're lovely little things. Oh, they're just as cute as can be. In fact, they're so cute that you wouldn't tell them to do the right thing. You let them run you and tell you what to do because you think it's cute. Yesterday afternoon, the scripture was read to you here about beating their swords into plowshares and their pruning hooks and the other instruments of war into instruments that you could use for peace. And I was thinking... I wonder if we'd read that scripture enough to some of our children, whether or not our brothers and sisters, our parents, would stop running around to all these toy places and getting them Gatling guns and tanks and uh, revolvers and everything else. There's nothing in the scriptures to show that children were used to, uh, or brought up, teaching the ways of war, murder, destruction. Your children don't have to be like the children of this world, just because the neighbor next door is going to have his whole side loaded down with two gun pistols and go around shooting everybody. No reason why your children have to be the same way. You don't celebrate Christmas, your children don't. Why must we act like the children in other respects? They understand that uh, there's no Santa Claus and that Christ Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. Why then is it necessary for us to teach our children to use these weapons of war? Don't they want to live in the new world of righteousness? They're your children. You want to see them live. 
And you boys and girls, do you love your parents? Are you very grateful to them because they have brought you into the world and given you life? Do you appreciate so much what they're doing for you and giving you food and clothing and a home and an education and bringing you a knowledge of the truth? Do you show it by expressing love to your parents? Or do you say to your parents when Papa says, uh, John and I would like you to go out there and mow that lawn, Pop, how much will you pay me? And then Father says, well, uh, I didn't have in mind paying you anything. And the young fellow says, well, I'll mow it if you give me 75 cents, not a cent less. And in order to get the mow on, why, well, you pay him 75 cents. Does it make sense, children, you young boys and girls that love your parents? You mean to say that some of you must be paid to do things around the house? And to you parents, do you want to spoil your children to make them think that the only thing in this world is materialism? They've got to be paid for everything. They can't do anything out of love for you even, your parents? Children and parents, you have a responsibility one towards another. Both of you want to live in the new world of righteousness. When I was out in Los Angeles, I was talking to the congregation there, the same as I'm talking to you, about how people feel they have to set up before themselves idols. And so out in California, living so near to Hollywood and all these young girls and young boys, Oh, they have to look like uh, this movie star or like that movie star. Why in the world should we ever set up any people like that as models to dress like or look like or appear like? They're the worst people. <laughs> Talking them, to them about the position of youth in the New World Society and showing them how that they could really love their parents and help them in so many things, and how the parents can show really more love towards their children by letting them know that they hold the rod of authority. Sometimes that rod stings pretty hard when it lands in the right place, but it does the youngster good, and that youngster won't hate you for it. He'll love you because he knows when you say you want him to do something, you mean it. While I was out there in Los Angeles, some young girls, teenagers, sent me a note. I'd like to read it to you. It says, Brother Nora, I have been chosen as spokesman for a group of teenage girls who are privileged enough to be members of the New World Society. We want to express our appreciation for the wonderful talk you gave on youth place in the New World Society, even though some of your points struck close to home, we appreciate the correcting. I am sure all of the youth of the New World Society join in our expression of thanks theocratically. It happened that I gave the talk out there extemporaneously on youth in the New World Society, and I was very glad that some of the youth there saw how they must pull away from these materialistic ideas and how they must get close to Jehovah's organization and their serve with Jehovah's people. If we are a separated people from this old world, let's be separated, not according to our costume. Oh, we'll dress like the people of this country. But let's not glorify individuals that live in adultery and fornication. Let us walk in the footsteps of Christ Jesus. Let us turn our way of life towards God's word. Let us truly be ministers of God and magnify his name. During the past five weeks, Some of us brothers from the Bethel home have had the privilege of visiting in Chicago and Vancouver, Los Angeles, Dallas, and now here in New York. 
And at these five assemblies, there were 3,976 persons that symbolized their dedication to Jehovah God by water baptism. That makes our hearts glad. Some of these were young, some were middle-aged, some were old. But they had seen the truth. Regardless of their age, regardless of their station in life, whether they're going to school, whether they be children of parents in the truth or out, whether they be old, God's law remains the same for every one of us. That's why it's so important for us to never forsake the assembly of ourselves together in the congregations of Jehovah's people. I'm sure that every one of you here that have already dedicated yourselves to Jehovah God are going to look well to the interest of these 3,976 that have so recently come into our organization, and we want to help them. On the other hand, with this youth coming into the organization, sometimes they bring in ideas of the old world, and they think, well, there must be a certain gaiety, a certain uh, sociable arrangement that is established within the organization. So in traveling around the country these past five weeks, I learned some things that I wasn't too well acquainted with before. I learned that some of the congregational servants were arranging for sociable parties. They were uh, arranging to gather different congregations nearby to come to roller rinks, and others were arranging to have dances and uh, having an orchestra hired. And then they'd write out announcements and send them to the different congregations that started out with the words, Hi there, Jehovah's Witnesses, let's get acquainted. And then they're invited to some sort of a party or sociable event. Where could Jehovah's Witnesses get better acquainted than at our Kingdom Hall, than at a circuit assembly, a district assembly, a right here? We don't need social parties, big get-togethers to learn God's people or who they are. We are in a new world society. Our love grows because we talk the truth and live with one another. Some congregations have gone so far as to appoint entertainment servants. I haven't seen that in any of the instructions sent out by the society. What greater joy can anyone have than to go out in the service preaching the good news? And if you want some relaxation, arrange it yourself. Let it be private. We're not trying to tell you what to do, whether you should go to a movie or whether you should go to a dance or whether you should look at television or go roller skating. That's your own private affair. But there's no reason why any congregation servant should get up in the congregation announcing such affairs and try to put sanction on them as though they were approved by God's organization. There's no reason why Kingdom Hall equipment that's dedicated to the advertising of the kingdom, king, uh, king and Kingdom should be loaned out for other social affairs or putting announcements on bulletin boards. Let all of us do exactly what Christ Jesus said we should do when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom. All the other things will be added unto you. But don't let all the other things, the material things in life, take the first place and the kingdom the second or way down the road somewhere. Let us be careful, having come into the Jehovah's organization. I remember when I was a little boy, there was a Methodist church not too far away from where we lived, and all the people were talking about their transforming the basement of the Methodist church, and eventually all the other churches turned to the same idea. But this church, it just stuck in my mind. There they were, transforming the basement of their church into a bowling alley, putting in pool rooms. And what do we have today? Gambling joints in all of these Catholic churches where they're having their bingo parties and all other kinds of things. We're not interested in that kind of practice. 
We do not have to attract anyone to Jehovah's organization by entertainment. It's the truth that makes us free. I know that all of you Jehovah's Witnesses are the happiest people in the world. Sometimes little things get in our lives that sidetrack us. And it's good to bring them forcefully to our attention. The devil can bring pressure against us by persecution. He can bring great pressure against us by the material things of this world. Let all of us study God's word. Meet regularly with our brothers and sisters and really get acquainted with them in the kingdom hall. In the circuit assemblies, the district assemblies, and here at this wonderful assembly, the uh, kingdom assembly, the triumphant kingdom assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses. Having these things in mind that all the brothers spoke to us about and meditating too upon these different talks that were given on pursuing my purpose in life. When I listened to those talks and heard the lives of these different individuals, I wondered how you felt about it. Could you arrange your affairs somehow to get into the pioneer work? This is a big work. Looking over the reports that come in from all over the world, and especially from the United States, in the past two years there have been about 40,000 new publishers have entered the Kingdom service here in the United States alone. Two years, 40,000 new publishers. And in those same two years there has been a decline in the number of pioneers. Why should that be, brothers? Did ever you think of entering into the pioneer service? When listening to these talks that were read, true life stories of different persons in different parts of the world, northern Odisha now, over in Burma, down in Puerto Rico, and in Panama, when you heard those true life stories read, did it make a thought come to your mind? I wonder where I'd be today if 20 years ago I had gone into the pioneer work. Why not some of you think now, where will you be 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, if you go into the pioneer work now? Could you have those same wonderful, joyful experiences? A pioneer has to get very, very close to God. He has to put his trust wholly in him. A pioneer isn't worried about all the material things of this world. They're satisfied like Jesus was, to lay his head on a stone. In fact, he had no place to lay his head. He had no home of his own, but think of the tremendous amount of work that he did in three and a half years. Think of the work the apostles did following him and the early Christians. And think of the work that the missionaries in the New World Society have done, taking the message of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Has it ever occurred to you that you might share in these joys and pleasures? Sometime when you get back home, in your prayers to Jehovah God, talk to him about the pioneer work. Talk about it for yourself. Maybe you can help some of your children in the pioneer work. But keep in mind, too, that the pioneer work is not just for children. It's for people that have been in all walks of life and of all ages. It's a privilege of service where you can put in your full time preaching this good news of the kingdom. You can do what Jesus said. Go ye therefore unto all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to think about the pioneer work. Think about Abraham, how he left his land he kept on traveling, moved about. Everybody recognized the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And when you get out in the pioneer work and go off into these other countries, or in the pioneer work in the United States, and work in your own territory, 
or go off into isolated territory as a special pioneer. People will see you. You're different. Your religion means something to you. You're devoted to the new world, to that organization that is so set on preaching the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. At this convention, the five assemblies here in the United States, there were 125,939 of our brothers that attended. These brothers have heard all of these talks just like you have heard. They've enjoyed them. They've gone back home and soon you will be going back home to brothers that couldn't get here and talk to them about it. Just in five Sundays now, at our public meeting, we've had a grand total of 171,701 persons who have heard the lecture that you heard this afternoon. These should be stimulated to turn to the thinking of God's word. There are things that we have to do. Big things. Getting this gospel of the kingdom preached. And you who make up part of this New World Society, are doing that preaching. I like to look back during the past few months, especially to the Watchtower campaign, when all of you brothers were out there diligently working worldwide, and you obtained 562,228 Watchtower subscriptions and Awake subscriptions. That was wonderful. Think of all those new people that are now getting that magazine and reading it. But think a little further. Think of your opportunity of going back and calling on these people and helping them to understand these magazines better and showing them the way to life eternal. Many of those who received Watchtowers may be in former subscription campaigns joined you during the months of April in getting out into the field service. I know that all of you put forth a very special effort to help the people of goodwill to join with you in distributing the booklet, Christendom or Christianity, Which One is the Light of the World? And they did a wonderful work in that distribution. I was looking over some figures just a few weeks ago to see what was accomplished in uh, putting out just that one message. Because all of you got behind it and believe that there was a truth expressed there that everyone should know, you worked hard. Now, I'm sure that Jehovah was very pleased because of the great blessing he poured upon you. When we started with that booklet in January, putting it through the factory, we had the idea that probably we could get it published in 10 languages by the month of April and begin its distribution amongst the uh, most prominent languages of the world. We were successful in that. But in the letter that went out to the branches, I told them that if any country could get this booklet translated into their own tongue and out, do it. And do you know that that booklet was translated and is now being distributed in 30 languages in 88 countries? <laughs> 21 million copies of it are already out into the hands of the people. And of course, you know, we're not quite done with it yet. During that month of April, through your good efforts and helping other people to go out in the work, we find a worldwide report turned in now to the effect that there were 625,256 publishers in 154 countries. That's a 19% increase over 1954. And then in April, on the 7th of April, all over the world in all the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses, we were celebrating the death of Christ Jesus. And everyone that was interested in the death of Christ Jesus and in the vindication of Jehovah's name, we were inviting to that memorial service and there were 863,973 in attendance. And of all of that great number, that great crowd, only 16,691 partook of the emblems. That means that here on earth associated with us, there are just a little more than 16,000 
of the temple class. And we know that Jehovah has come to his temple. And we know that he is using these living stones today to guide and direct the work under Christ Jesus. And when we look back to 1918 and 22 and 25 and those earlier years after the First World War and after Jehovah God came to his temple and how he gathered together the remnant and the work that they were doing, we often wondered what would be the outcome. But we see today, we see that after that remnant was gathered together and this temple of Jehovah God was built up, we see that he wanted a great crowd of people from every nation, kindred, and tongue to come up to that place of worship. And certainly among Jehovah's Witnesses and New World Society, we hold that place of worship high in our esteem. Above all the nations of the earth, our worship of the sovereign ruler of the universe comes first and will not let anything interfere with it. And we don't want it to interfere with anybody else's worship either. If the other crowd, these other sheep are coming, we want to help them, we want to feed them. And so Jehovah's Witnesses continue to expand this good news further and further into more nations. Very recently we finished a home in El Salvador. There was a brother here that gave an experience just the other day who had a part in the building of that home and working with the missionaries and he was baptized here last Friday. These things have an effect. If that home did nothing else than bring one person in the truth, it was worth it, even though the society spent around $50,000 to get the land and to put up this home, which we will use for a branch office, a kingdom hall, and a missionary home. That shows expansion into a new country. Just recently, we bought more property in the land of Costa Rica. There we're building a new branch office, missionary home, and putting a kingdom hall on the second floor for the assembly of Jehovah's people there. Just to the north of us, in Toronto, in Canada, the society is now spending over a half a million dollars in the purchase of property and the building of a no nice, large Bethel home and factory, printing plant, and storage place for the expanding work in that country. And right here in Brooklyn, we're putting up a two million dollar building. These things wouldn't be possible except for you, all of you brothers and sisters in love with the great expansion work that's going on, are going out in the field service, preaching the good news of the kingdom, distributing magazines. Probably some of you, when you go to your Tuesday night book study, walk to that study and visit the people on the way, stopping at their home. It would be a fine thing if every one of us in going to our Tuesday night book studies would get a couple of blocks of, along the way and every Tuesday night leave home a little bit earlier and distribute magazines maybe for a half hour. Calling at the homes of the people, doing magazine work house to house. We place a lot of magazines. About 54% of our brothers in the United States are putting out magazines now in regular distribution from house to house. But suppose all of the 187,000 in the United States started to do that. I'm quite sure that the building that we're putting up would become too small, and we'd like it. Because it would mean a greater witness given in this land and all lands through the use of the Watchtower magazine and the Awake. We're very, very grateful to you for all of your contributions that you send into the society, which makes it possible to build these larger places in Toronto, in the United States, and in other parts of the world. It shows that all of you are intensely interested in expansion, in getting this good news of the kingdom preached unto the end of the earth. And Jehovah God is going to continue to bless you in doing this preaching work. Let's just think for a moment of the wonderful things that God has given to us just in this assembly in five days' time to use in the preaching of the good news. You know, every one of us have an awful lot to do in the next couple of weeks. We have the second volume of the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures to read.
to study. We have qualified to be ministers. We have a booklet on survival after death. And then we have the new book that was released yesterday on your survival after Armageddon. It's possible that you may be do that, that you may do that. Why not find out how? Why not be absolutely sure by reading that book carefully, looking up the scriptures, and seeing your position in the New World Society? And then we have that public talk of this afternoon that you want to get well acquainted with and distribute to other persons. There's five things that we have to read. It's going to take time. Isn't it wonderful how Jehovah God looks after us? He's not at all stingy, but bountifully he spreads his table with truths for us to feed upon. Let us not look now at that table of bounties and say to ourselves, I'm not hungry. We have to be hungry for the truth. It's the thing that gives us life. It's the thing that keeps us alive. It's the thing that keeps us going. Let's dig into these things. Let us become more and more spiritually minded. There are a number of our brothers that come into the New World Society. They say they dedicate their lives to Jehovah God. They're baptized. And then we see them growing cold or indifferent. Did it ever occur to you just why? If you observe the individual, you'll see that he hasn't been coming to meetings recently. He's not really alert to the wonderful things that Jehovah God is revealing to him, to all of us, through the watchtower, through his publications. It is absolutely necessary for us to keep alive spiritually, to study, to read, and to make these ideas our own. Not just read it to say to someone, we've read it. No, but to understand it. And when we see through this convention how clear the vision is before us of the new world of righteousness and our position, how that we come into this road and we're marching up to that temple position, on that glorious hill, there to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's real. It's not imaginary. It's not something we can't get a hold of. It's there. A new world society exists. The true worship of the sovereign ruler of the universe is being carried on today by thousands of people all over the world, all of them Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah God says that there are many, many more from all nations, kindreds and tongues that are going to come into this new world society and get right on that road with you and march up to that temple court there to worship and praise Jehovah God, ignoring the wishes of this old world. Oh, we'll do the things that this world wants us to do as long as they are in full accord and harmony with God's law. But above all things, we will do what Jehovah God asks us to do and commands us to do and we'll do it with joy and gladness even though these organizations of the world kill us for doing it. So we move ahead with joy and gladness. In this triumphant march, we ourselves having the truth we become a sweet odor to all of these other sheep and we're a sweet odor to ourselves. It's a nice smell when we're here in this stadium with Jehovah's Witnesses. But when we go out into this old world and start preaching to the religionists, the commercialists, the politicians, and to many of the people that are in hearty support of this old world that want to see it stand and keep out God's kingdom, we stink to these people. We're glad we do because we don't want to be any part of them because we want to be different. It isn't that we want to be offensive. 
but they just don't know what a sweet perfume is. Their noses have been so contaminated. But we who have come into Jehovah's organization and live with Jehovah's people, meet with them, study with them. You who are parents, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and you children, how wonderful it is for you to respect your parents, to love them, and do things for them. How wonderful it is for you young folks to be anxious to go to meetings, to learn and to listen. Someday, you'll have to take over responsible positions in Jehovah's organization. Some of you young folks have already dedicated your lives because we see you at these immersion pools, eight, nine, ten years old. Some of you 12, 13, some of you 18, 19, some of you just turning to 21. Many of you in your teens, do all of you appreciate that you have said to your Father in heaven that you are going to do his will the way it is written in his word? And do you parents who are raising these children realize that you have said too that you're going to raise your children the way that he says they shall be raised? Do all of us realize, having made a dedication to Jehovah God, that he pulls us away from this old world into his own organization, there to remain holy, even as he is holy. We are a separated people. We're grateful for it. I hope and pray that every one of you who have dedicated your lives will remain holy within his organization. There's one thing that we desire for every one of our brothers and sisters, and that is to see them maintain their integrity. We love to see them stay faithful and true, because when they do, they prove the devil a liar. And when they prove the devil a liar by maintaining their integrity, it makes our Father glad. It's written, Be wise, my son, and make my heart glad, that I may answer him that has reproached me all of these thousands of years. Every one of you here can do it. All of you 45,144 that are here at this closing meeting can maintain your integrity by the undeserved kindness of Jehovah God, by standing close to his organization, by being faithful to him and preaching this good news of the kingdom under the ends of the earth, by being intensely interested in this great expansion work, preaching unto the ends of the earth this good news of the kingdom without let up. We want to be a going organization when the battle of Armageddon comes. Whether it be out amongst the people or whether it be underground. If they force all of us underground, we'll go underground and we'll keep on preaching. And the day may come when they'll put that pressure on you. I can't help but think of our brothers down there in Ciudad Rahelia in Dominican Republic. They sent greetings to you this afternoon. They were phoned in on the telephone. But we sent missionaries down there years ago. And every time some of those missionaries came home, uh, they never give them a re-entry paper. And a number of our missionaries that are down there have never come home because they have brought many of the other sheep into the organization. They have taken the lead in service. And they know that if they ever leave that country, which is under a totalitarian rule, a dictator, they'll never get back into that country again. And even though they're not so far from these shores, those missionaries are willing to go out and get jobs, support themselves, stay in that land, even though there is a ban on the work. They stay there and preach and hold together Jehovah's organization and under these adverse conditions, our brothers in the Dominican Republic are growing. We're glad of that. So they send greetings from Dominican Republic and may Jehovah's blessings be with you. All here wish you Jehovah's blessing there. And we wish the same for them. It's 
too bad these five-day conventions have to come to a close, but they must. You've made arrangements to go back with your local congregation, some of you into the pioneer service. You missionaries from foreign lands will be going to your home countries again. You branch servants that have come here will be returning. And then some of us will be crossing the seas, going to London, starting in with a light convention in London next Wednesday, and then on to Paris and Rome.